Hello and welcome to lecture number 11. Today's topic will address many aspects of American society from approximately the end of the War of 1812 to the Civil War. The presentation will explore several transformations in American society, including changes in agriculture, transportation, industry, and growing urbanization. We will also see how American society was characterized by another religious awakening, followed by a reform era where many groups of individuals worked to improve American society. The opening of the West had a major influence over several transformations of American society. This is particularly seen beginning with agriculture. In the years following the War of 1812, the population of western regions of the nations grew along with the rest of the country. In 1790, the nation's population was about 4 million. Almost all non-Indians lived east of the Appalachian Mountains. However, by 1840, the country's population had skyrocketed to about 17 million, with about a third of its population living between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. These maps identify population distribution in the United States in 1790 and again in 1850. As you can see with the map on the left, there were very few areas with high population density outside of states along the Atlantic coast. The map on the right shows that by 1850 there were regions of high population densities in the Northeast and parts of the Midwest. The Ohio River Valley, which included the old Northwest Territory, saw tremendous growth in population as people sought fertile land to establish farms. This map of the Northwest Territory encompasses much of today's Upper Midwest or Great Lakes region. This includes the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and one section of Minnesota. The increase in settlement was dramatic. Ohio's population increased from 45,000 in 1800 to over 500,000 in 1820. By 1840, it had grown to over 1.5 million. Michigan's population increased from 5,000 in 1810 to over 200,000 by 1840. Most pioneers traveled in family units and initially practiced subsistence agriculture. Men were usually responsible for much of the heavy work, such as clearing trees and plowing fields. Women had a wide range of different chores, which never seemed to end, one of which involved milking cows. They might place milk in a wooden tub, like this one shown here, where milk would cool for one or two days. Cream could then be skimmed after it rose to the top. Among other things, cream could then be churned to make butter. During the late 18th century, farm women shifted from the plunger churn, shown in the background of this image, to the more efficient barrel churn, which increased their production of butter. As the years went by, women often became responsible for selling eggs, butter, cheese, and other items to supplement their family's income. These new responsibilities did not take away from their traditional chores at home, but only added to them. Many of these pioneers to the Old Northwest eventually became commercial farmers, exporting their goods outside of the United States or shipping them to markets in the East. The Old Northwest later replaced the Northeast as the center of American agriculture. There were many factors which led to this shift. First, as the East became more industrialized, demand for Western farm goods increased. Secondly, Western farms benefited from newer technologies. Farms in New England tended to be smaller and uneven, whereas those farther West were larger and flatter. 
labor-saving devices such as the McCormick Reaper or John Deere's steel plow made farming more efficient on the larger farms further west. The expansion of commercial farming could lead to profits for Americans as farm goods were increasingly exported. We can see from this advertisement that the manufacture of agricultural implements became a major industry as well. Overall, this agricultural boom had an impact not only on the West, but the nation as a whole. However, this reliance on commercial farming did have negative consequences. It required farmers to take out loans to invest in the labor-saving farm equipment. When credit became short, like during the Panic of 1819 and in 1837, it could be devastating for many. Also, it made American farmers reliant on outside markets for their goods. Events in New York City, or even outside the United States, could have a major impact on a farmer living in a small town in central Ohio. Newer technologies and the advent of commercial farming did not just impact the Old Northwest, but other regions of the country, particularly the Old Southwest, were also transformed. The region outlined on this map identifies several states of the Old Southwest. These included Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, and the Arkansas Territory. Settlement in this part of the South exploded beginning in the 1820s and 30s as cotton became a valuable cash crop. By the 1820s, cotton became the nation's leading export with Alabama and Mississippi producing nearly half the country's cotton. During this era, the American South became the world's largest supplier of cotton. It was the perfection of the cotton gin in 1793 by Eli Whitney which led to the expansion of cotton plantations in the South and Old Southwest. This allowed for the easy separation of seeds from their cotton bowls on large farms. Now, short staple cotton could easily be grown and shipped to British textile mills or the emerging American mills typically located in the North. The growth of cotton production led to an increased demand for slaves as farmers in the Southwest invested heavily in land and slave labor. Part of the reason for the agricultural boom was due to transformations in the American transportation system. This map identifies major rivers, roads, and canals in the United States. The river system had been used for centuries to transport people and goods along the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys. However, the advent of steamboats transformed a three to four month voyage from New Orleans to Louisville to about 25 days. The 1820s also saw a major increase in canal construction. New York's Erie Canal linked the Hudson River to Lake Erie. The canal was over 360 miles in length, took eight years to construct, and cost an amazing $7 million. It transformed New York into the nation's largest city and shortened the journey from Buffalo to New York City from 20 to 6 days. This opened huge eastern markets to crops produced by western farmers when it was completed in 1825. It also led to the emergence of towns like Lockport along the canal, shown here.
by the 1830s, investment in railroad construction outpaced that of canals, and by 1850, approximately 9,000 miles of track were built. However, most of the railroad lines linked eastern cities to one another. The black lines on this map identify railroads constructed up to 1850, whereas the red lines indicate those built after 1850. The 1850s saw a boom in railroad construction as finally the Great Lakes were connected by rail to states along the Atlantic coast. This era is also characterized by the rise of industry in the United States. One of the best examples of early American industry can be seen with the woolen mills of Lowell, Massachusetts, where textiles were manufactured. Fed with cotton produced by slave labor in the American South, cloth production increased from 4 million yards in 1817 to 323 million in 1843. Conditions were difficult for many laborers in these factories. 80% of the workers in the Waltham and Lowell mills were women. Most were young and unmarried. The work environment was far from ideal. They worked long hours, usually in hot and humid temperatures. During economic hard times, beginning in the late 1830s, hours were extended and the pace of machines was sped up to increase output. As the cost of mass-produced textiles dropped, some Americans began to purchase their clothing rather than making it themselves. This was particularly true for men living in urban areas. By the 1840s, we see the forerunner of today's modern suit jacket becoming fashionable. New England's textile mills are good examples of America's rise in manufacturing, but there were other industries and regions of the nation impacted by this trend. As this map shows, by 1850, there was an increased density in manufacturing in the Northeast, but new manufacturing centers arose in areas like Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati. As the country industrialized, it also became much more urban as large numbers of people began to congregate in the nation's largest cities. This map identifies major cities in the United States in 1820. If you look closely, most, but not all, large cities were seaports. Some notable cities were New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Charleston, and New Orleans. Over the next 40 years, the nation's population increased considerably as birth rates remained high and immigration increased, particularly in the 1840s and 1850s. Only one American city had a population of over 100,000 in 1830. That was New York. But 30 years later, eight additional cities had reached that level. By 1860, New York City boasted a population of 800,000. Increasingly, incredible inequalities in wealth could be seen between the rich and poor living in these large American cities. Maybe some statistics can demonstrate the growing concentration of wealth in a small segment of society. In 1833, the richest 4% of Boston's residents owned 59% of the city's wealth. Fifteen years later, they owned about two-thirds. In 1828, the richest 4% of New York's population controlled about half the city's wealth. By 1848, they owned two-thirds. John Lewis Crimmel painted this portrait of himself and his sister-in-law with her children around 1812. It shows a prosperous, middle-class German family living in Philadelphia that had been in the United States for about five years. The dress and home of the criminal children can be contrasted to the homeless and orphan children living in New York City. This image shows another prosperous family from about 30 years later. 
it may indicate some of the increased standard of living seen by many wealthy in the nation. Notice the curtains. They also have a wall hanging. The family can afford a piano with scrolled legs and a small desk with elegantly curved legs. The ladies are posed in non-productive but improving activities such as music and reading. This image shows New York's famous, or infamous, Five Points District. It gained a reputation as being one of the nation's worst slums. It was known for its filth, as well as crowded and unhealthy conditions. There was also a great deal of crime. In some cases, newly arrived immigrants, like the Irish, congregated in places like this because they had no other options available. Often, newly arrived immigrants faced persecution. This was particularly true of the Irish, as many American Protestants distrusted the Catholicism of many Irish immigrants. Many native-born Americans resented the large numbers of Irish, as they were often willing to work for low wages. No Irish need apply was a sign often found at the front of American factories. While many Irish came to America as a rot attacked their potato crop, many Germans also came to the United States. As you can see from this figure, German and Irish immigration increased between 1830 and 1860, but the growth was tremendous during the decade of the 1850s. Each brought with them their unique customs and contributed to the nation's growth in many ways. Perhaps as a counter to many changes in the United States, which took place during the early 1800s, many Americans began to look toward religion in the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening had its origins in New England in the 1790s, yet over the years it swept across many parts of the nation. The movement was often characterized by what were called camp meetings. They involved large numbers of religious followers who might spend up to a week listening to many preachers call on the audience to repent and prepare themselves for the second coming of the Messiah. The largest camp meeting took place in Kentucky in 1801, where it was estimated some 25,000 attended their services. Possibly the most influential speaker to emerge from this movement was Charles Finney, a former lawyer who experienced his own conversion in 1821. In common language entire audiences could understand, he argued that anyone could achieve salvation. While rejecting the ideas of earlier preachers like Jonathan Edwards, Finney instead argued human nature need not be dominated by sinfulness. Men and women could will themselves away from sin. He later became the president of Oberlin College and established a theological department where a generation of young ministers were influenced by his ideas. Finney spoke to huge audiences and was quite successful in gaining converts. His message of living a life of perfection influenced many and led to a movement where people attempted to reform and improve American society. Finney wasn't the only individual attempting to create a society based on perfection. This map identifies the locations of several different religious and utopian communities formed during this era. The actions of many Mormon followers will be discussed in the next lecture, but the blue diamond on this map identifies the followers of the British philanthropist Robert Owen, whose most famous settlement was in New Harmony, Indiana. The Shakers also saw many followers.
The Shakers established 20 settlements in several states. Overall, they included about 6,000 members. Their goal was to become self-sufficient. They were known for their farming and sale of furniture and handicrafts, which were simple and beautiful. However, they also advocated celibacy, and their numbers reached their peak between 1820 and 1860. The Shakers were far from the only reformers attempting to improve American society overall. There were many different groups working hard throughout the country, including supporters of temperance. Abuse of alcohol was seen by many as a major problem in the United States. By the late 1820s, the average male drank one half pint of liquor each day. Many religious reformers saw alcohol as immoral, and factory owners complained about workers who drank heavily on and off the job. The image shown here demonstrates some of the problems often affiliated with abusive drinking. In 1826, the American Society for the Promotion of Temperance was formed. This organization encouraged drinkers to take pledges of abstinence and lobbied states to prohibit the sale of alcohol. On the left, we see a man taking the temperance pledge to abstain from alcohol while his wife and child look on. By the 1840s, rates of alcohol consumption had dropped in half as compared to the 1820s. Reforms were also seen in the nation's public education system. For many years, most Americans believed education was a family's or church's responsibility. States also did not require children to attend public schools. Probably the leading reformer addressing issues of public education was Horace Mann, the first secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education in 1837. Mann implemented several reforms. First, attendance became mandatory in Massachusetts and the school year was extended. The curriculum was also modified to emphasize practical education with courses like arithmetic, geography, and the sciences rather than the classics. Many states, particularly in the North, adopted similar reforms and standardized textbooks such as the McGuffey Readers became vehicles not only to educate children but to Americanize newly arrived immigrants. One additional reform movement addressed opposition to the institution of slavery. The inhumanity of slavery prompted some religious groups, like the Quakers, to support abolition of slavery in the years following the American Revolution. However, one organization hoped for the removal of free blacks from the United States. The American Colonization Society was formed in 1817 with a unique set of goals. First, it called for the gradual emancipation of slaves with compensation for slave owners. Secondly, it involved transporting newly freed slaves back to Africa to what became the nation of Liberia. At its heart, while many supporters of this movement were opposed to slavery, they also believed blacks were inferior to whites and the two races could not live together. This image, taken by Rufus Hansen, shows Joseph Jenkins Roberts. He eventually became the first president of Liberia. He was one of an estimated 12 to 15,000 who migrated to Liberia. Its capital was Monrovia, named for the American president, James Monroe. This image shows Paul Cuff. He worked on behalf of the rights of African Americans by supplying money and ships to freed slaves hoping to leave the United States and move to Liberia. 
Eventually, there weren't many slaves who were granted their freedom by the American Colonization Society. Supporters simply weren't willing to raise enough funds necessary to compensate the slave owners. Furthermore, many free blacks had no desire to move to Africa. They were African Americans, born in the United States, whose ancestors had come from Africa. Blacks were involved with the abolitionist movement as well. David Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World was published in 1829 and called for the immediate and violent end to slavery. Other black activists included former slaves Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. In 1831, white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison began publication of The Liberator. He called for the immediate elimination of slavery. Many women were involved in the anti-slavery movement. This image shows Angelina Grimke, born to a slaveholding family in South Carolina. She, along with her sister Sarah, traveled to New England and delivered lectures to many anti-slavery societies. When she and her sister spoke to mixed audiences of both men and women, some thought it improper for women to lecture to men. Criticism of the Grimke sisters prompted each to become advocates of women's rights the final reform movement to be discussed in this presentation. The Grimke sisters were not the only advocates of women's rights. On the right we see a portrait of Margaret Fuller. As a child she studied Latin, English, and other classics and later argued women must be allowed to develop their own intellectual abilities. Other women's rights advocates included Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, among others. In 1848, Canton, shown here with her sons on the left, and Mott organized a women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Delegates protested the lack of property rights for married women and women's lack of voting rights. Their Declaration of Sentiments, modeled after the Declaration of Independence, argued that all men and women are created equal. It was not until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920 that all women were granted the right to vote in the United States. For more information about this convention, you may click on the hyperlink below. Some of the primary ideas included in this lecture can now be brought for review. This presentation addressed many aspects of American society between the War of 1812 and the Civil War. Maybe there are two concepts which can be considered. First, which transformations do you believe had the largest impact on American society during this era? Secondly, you may want to describe the different reform movements and evaluate which you believe to be most successful. This concludes lecture number 11. American Society and the Economy from 1815 to 1860. The next few slides will include hyperlinks to more information and a list of sources used to develop this presentation. Have a great day.